recap, in December of 2017, we brought in a licensed professional counselor who works with addiction. And some of you attended that day um, in December 2017. And he came and was, it was, this was like the initiation of this ministry where we learned about people who are addicted to pornography. We learned a little bit about how to understand the struggle. We learned that we had various different talks, workshops. And then from there, a group of servants met that February in 2018. And we decided that we, there was, this is a struggle in our church and in our community, and we need to aggressively come up with a program in order to be able to serve those who are struggling with addiction to pornography. And from there, we basically met monthly over the last 18 months discussing how we can tackle this issue, what are the methods that we can come about it in terms of being able to, 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 to serve this problem and to help this problem, and that's where we are today. So we're excited that you guys are here today. So as you all know, we are ready to present what the group has been tirelessly working on for the last period of time. So we know that studies show that many, many people are struggling with pornography. Actually, some of the stats will say that all men are struggling with lust or pornography in some way or another. That it's not just, you know, every few men. But in some way or another, every single man is, and woman is struggling with lust in some way or another. And it comes in different shapes and forms. And women aren't immune from this. They are the ones with the greatest increase in engaging with sexual content. So we used to think traditionally that this was just a male issue, but now in the modern era, we're finding that more and more women are also struggling with pornography and viewing explicit content. So this is where the need is. So 60% of Christian families have an acute problem with pornography. 60%. We're not talking about, if you think about it, that's every other family and some. So we recognize that there's a problem. 42% of men said that they regularly visit sexually explicit content, websites, chats, read sexually explicit magazines, or romance novels. Now, the romance novels are probably a little bit outdated, but if you think about now in the modern era, Instagram. So many men are just quick, quickly flipping through net photos of people posing in certain poses. And it's just content that stirs up the person's mind. In addition, 64% of men said that they spend at least some time each week online for sexual purposes. 64% of men. Again, the, the goal today is not to allow you to understand that this is a problem, because all of you know that this is a problem. But we're just presenting some preliminary statistics for us to be able to kind of uh, understand what we're facing here and how the gravity of what the struggle is. About one in five of these said they spend five or more hours every week. And our church is not exempt from this. If you talk to so many of the, of the fathers of the church, they'll tell you that a lot of confessions that they're hearing revolve around the subject of lust, pornography, sexual addiction. It's not something that we say, oh, it's just those people who are on the outside of the church that are struggling with. It's very much us within the church, servants, people that we're serving are struggling with this matter. So this is why this issue is so important. And this is why St. Mark's has taken this initiative and we want to share it with the global church in order to be able to help not just local St. Mark's community, but the church at large. So we're thankful and we're grateful for all those who are coming from other churches. So in response, we decided to create this ministry called the War on Pornography. And it's a recovery program based on the rich church tradition that we have. We have an Orthodox tradition that, that is built on the rites and the, and the teachings and the foundations of the church fathers. And we're hoping that we can take what we have in our rich tradition and apply it to what the rest of the Christian world is, has built on. So they, we, we took a foundation from what other Christian churches were, have established and we added to it based on our tradition. And that's what we're hoping to share today. So what is the goal? The goal is that we equip those who sign up today to be mentors in order to help those who are struggling with this addiction. So those of you who are attending today, 
Our hope is by the end of the day, you say, I want to be part of this ministry. I want to be a mentor, and I want to help somebody who's struggling and be part of their, their road to recovery. And I'll explain how that happens in a second. So can I help? This ministry serves different ages, gender, struggling with porn, and each member will be paired with somebody who's struggling for a period of 90 days. 90 days. Now you think to yourself, wow, that's a quite some time. But what does that actually entail? So what our hope is, is that we will have the person who's struggling be paired up with another person, and for a period of 90 days, they'll have exercises, they'll have a sense of accountability, they'll have a sense of encouragement, and the goal is, is that to constantly be checking in on that person regularly, and by the end of the 90 days, that person is on the road to recovery. Will they be perfect? Maybe by the grace of God, if God empowers and, and, and instills a sense of victory in that person. But is that guaranteed? Not necessarily. Because all of us are in different journeys, and all of us have different struggles, and all of us have different psychological backgrounds and experiences that have made this struggle, for some, harder than others. But the, the goal is, is that we have something now available for those who are struggling to be able to utilize. So we want to talk a little bit about the characteristics of those who are mentors. So you're coming today and you're hoping to attend this day and become a mentor. That's the goal. And we want to instill in you a sense of confidence that you can be a mentor. Now maybe some of you will say, you know what, I'm struggling. How am I going to help somebody struggle if me myself is struggling? The goal is, is that even if you are struggling, you're able to encourage, and you're able to assist, and you're able to uplift one another. That two are better than one, because if one falls, the other is there to pick him up. And that's, that's kind of the, the objective. And for those who have a victory, who have God has given them the grace to overcome a struggle with lust and pornography, those people, you're more along the road, and you're able to help those who have been through this journey, who are struggling with this journey, and equipping them and sharing your own experiences of how you have had victory and how you continue to have victory. Because whether it's pornography or whether it's lust or whether it's any struggle, all of us have some sort of desires that often are misoriented or misguided and not according with what the will of God is. So the goal is that we're here to encourage each other. So what are the characteristics of members? I don't know if you guys can read it, but number one is humility. The first characteristic is humility. That we're hoping that every single one of us sitting here recognizes that no one is greater than the person next to him. That all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's from that recognition that we all are struggling and we all have different struggles that we recognize that we need to approach this ministry humbly knowing that I am not better than you and you are not better than me. I'm, just because I have an area of victory in this particular struggle doesn't necessarily mean that I don't struggle in another way. So the first characteristic that we want every single person to always be constantly aware of, to be humble. Because people recognize when you're coming at them from a judgmental fashion. People recognize when you think that you're better than them. People recognize when they think that you think you're superior. But when you come at people, when you're discussing with people, and you're sharing with people, they can sense if you are feeling them, if you are, are, are joining them in their struggle and joining them in their burden. So we want to have a sense of humility. The second thing that we want to have is a sense of patience. What happens if after, after the 90-day program, the person st struggles? What happens if after day, day three, the person relapses? What happens if after the first day, the person relapses? You restart the program. You say, okay, we, we're at day three. Let's restart from day one. What happens if day five, they're victorious for day five, and then day five, they relapse again? It, need, it requires patience that this is a journey, that this is, some, like, again, we don't know the circumstances in which a person has become addicted to pornography. All of us have different, again, different journeys. So patience is an essential component of how we are going to approach being mentors. And if you think about how oftentimes we expect people to be further along the way than they really are. So you say to yourself, you've committed to be part of this program. 
Somebody, you're, you're given somebody to mentor. And then after day seven, or after day 30, say they're doing really great after 30 days, you think oftentimes that if they relapse, that was a failure. No, but for 30 days, that person was sober. That's a victory. That was 30 days that that person hadn't been sober prior. So it requires patience, it requires a sense of hope, and it requires a sense of encouragement. Is that you always have to be gentle. You always have to have a sense of encouragement. Is that when a person falls, you don't say, how could you do that? How could you fall? You were so good for 30 days. But a sense of, hey man, I'm really proud of you. Or, hey, sister, I'm really proud of you. You were, you were sober for 30 days. Let's, let's focus on the grace that God gave you in those 30 days. And let's pray that he gives you another 30 days. Yes, you fall, but if the righteous man falls down seven times a day, how much more are we to fall every single day? So the goal is for us to recognize that we need to be a sense of encouragement. The Holy Spirit is the encourager. So you have the role with the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to be the encourager as a mentor. That when somebody's struggling, you don't kick them when they're down. You lift them. And that's the role of the church, is to lift those who are struggling. Trustworthiness. This is a big one that we want people to have today. Is that when somebody comes to me and they share with me a struggle, there is a deep sense of confidentiality here. A deep sense of confidentiality. If for any reason what a person shares with you gets shared with another person, the bond is broken. Your ability to help that person is going to be incredibly difficult. Because once a person loses trust in the person that's mentoring them, it's very difficult to come back from. So we want to have a sense that when you are entrusted with a person that you're mentoring, that you recognize that there is a deep sense of trustworthiness that you have. The fifth thing that we want is people to be praying constantly. Pray without ceasing. Every single night when, you ha when you're presented with that person, pray for them. Think of them. Throughout the day, constantly be sent saying, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon this person. Give them the grace to endure this day. Because the more that we pray for one another, the more that the grace of God works with each, with, within us, the more the grace of God encourages us, the more the grace of God enable us, enables us and instills in us a sense of hope. So we want to constantly be praying for the people that God has entrusted us with. And lastly, being present and available. Being present and available. What do I mean by that? Is that a lot of times, someone will be distracted when you're sitting with them. You ever sit with somebody and then you see like they're looking off into space or you know, they're not attentive to you or their phone vibrates so they quickly look at it? How do you expect to be able to help somebody who is struggling with a deep addiction to pornography when you're not really with them? So we want to really have this deep sense of I'm present, I'm available, I'm here for you. Everything at that moment when I'm with you is on hold. Everything. There is nothing that is more important than you at this moment. And that's, that's really part of what we are praying. And we need to be committed. We need to be committed. Is that those of you who, you, who decide today want to take on a, ment a member, you want to be a mentor for a person who's struggling, there needs to be a sense of commitment. Because there is, a set, there is going to be a specific sort of requirement that we're asking for every single person that decides that they want to do this. So, we're going to quickly go through this, but the skills of mentors are active listening. So what is active listening? Active listening is basically being, like we just said before, your undivided attention to the person that is sitting before you. And active listening doesn't mean that I'm just staying silent. It's participating. It's asking questions. It's being, being when, when a person is sitting before you and they're discussing with you something, it's not that you aren't engaged. It's that you're attentive to every word that they're saying. The second thing is you want to set respectful boundaries. What do I mean by respectful boundaries? We're going to get into this in a second because this is really important. Is that a lot of times when people serve, they don't have a sense of boundaries. They don't have a sense of, okay, this is what I'm giving, and these are, this is the parameters of which I'm, I'm, I need to set in order to have a sense of healthiness for myself 
And sometimes we give too much without having a sense of regard of how much I need to be encouraging myself and praying myself and, you know, building myself up. So the servant must establish healthy boundaries with the members. With the member, a boundary is the perimeter of the relationship between the servant and the member, which includes ownership, responsibility, respect, and freedom. So these are the ten laws of boundaries. And the reason why I wanted to talk about boundaries is because these are these. This is very important with specific to sexual addiction. So, the law of sowing and reaping. Our actions have consequences. What you sow is what you will reap. So the more that you give, the more that the person will expect, and the more that you give of yourself, great, fantastic, but be aware of how much you give. Be aware of how much you make yourself available. Be aware that the, we, we've set specific parameters of how much we want you to be involved in the person, but if you overdo it at times, the person will become dependent on you. And the goal is not to create a sense of dependence. The goal is for you to be a link between that person and Christ, not to be Christ to that person, not to be that person's savior. Is that God is the redeemer, God is the healer. You are just the means by which the person receives encouragement. The law of responsibility. We are responsible to each other, but not for each other. We are responsible to each other, but not for each other. I'm not responsible for your actions. There is freedom. You have the choice but I am responsible to you to hold you accountable and to encourage you. The law of power. We have power over some things. We don't have power over other things, including changing people. There are some things that we have the power to do, which is, again, to make yourself available, to inspire people, to encourage people, but you don't have the power to change people. And that's a huge, huge, huge thing that we need to be aware of. The law of respect. If we wish for others to respect our boundaries, we need to respect theirs. The law of motivation. We must be free to say no before we can wholeheartedly say yes. This is one of my biggest problems. Personally, confession. We need to be able to say no before we wholeheartedly can say yes. One of my New Year's resolutions two years ago was to say yes to less. Because I say yes to everything. Sure, sure, sure. A person says, hey, can I talk to you right now? Absolutely. Pull out my phone and talk to the person. But I'm severing certain other relationships and other important things for the sake of putting that person ahead of the, of, of the, of the you know, maybe my wife or maybe my responsibilities. So being aware of the law of motiva motivation. What is your motivation? We must be free to say no before we wholeheartedly can say yes. The law of evaluation. We need to evaluate the pain our boundaries cause others. What does this mean? We need to evaluate the pain our boundaries cause others. Is that at times, when you set a boundary, a person's not going to like that. A person's going to be like, you said that you were going to be my mentor, and you said that you were going to be available. And we said, no. We set strict parameters that this is a relationship, that I am not the person that you constantly are depending on, but I am the person that is there to encourage you because you need to have a sense of self-dependence and godly dependence. Is that you need to cooperate with the Spirit of God to encourage, to be encouraged by Him and not to constantly come to me as the means by which you seek encouragement. Now this may sound counterproductive to a lot of people because in our culture, in the way that we understand what it means to serve, we understand that we constantly have to always put ourselves out there for people, even at times where it's unhealthy. But boundaries are important because when you set those boundaries, sometimes some people will not be happy about that. And sometimes the person that you're mentoring will say, you know what, you said that you were going to be my mentor and I expect this and this and this and this and this from you. But that's why it's important to set the boundary ahead of time and to say, this is what I'm willing to give of myself. This is what my role in this ministry is towards you. And here is how I want to help you. The law of proactivity. We take action to solve problems based on our values, wants, and needs. What does that mean? We take action to solve problems based on our values, wants, and needs. What do you guys think of that one? Is that I'm part of this process, I'm also in this struggle with you, and at the same time that 
I have to remind myself what my values, how, how, we, are, how we are doing this and what the goal is, what the purpose is, what my needs are and what that person's needs are, and what their wants and what my wants are. So I have to constantly be aware of myself in projecting on that person. Because sometimes we project what we want on that person. We project what our needs are on that person. But we have to recognize that each person is their own, they, again, it has their own specific unique journey that has gotten them to that place and that moment. And if I want, if I try to recreate my journey in that person, good luck. Good luck. Because we're all unique and God has made us all unique for a specific purpose and reason. So my struggle is not your struggle and your struggle is not my struggle. My struggle can help you, but I shouldn't project how God has given me grace on you. Does that make sense? And I think a lot of times we're so quick to say, well, God did it with me this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way, and I want him to do it the same way with you. But God works with each of us in a very unique fashion. The law of envy. We will never get what we want if we focus outside our boundaries onto what others have. The law of envy. We will never get what we want if we focus outside our boundaries on what others have. What does that mean? Is that it's really easy for us to focus on what God has done with others and what God is doing in others and envy that. I have a friend whose God has given victory in the specific area of pornography. And the way God has worked in a person's life, I sometimes envy that. I'm like, man, that's amazing what God has done and how he's done it. And you, you, you begin to start to say, I wish God would work in, that, in this person in the same way that he worked in that person. And there's this idea that we will never get what we want if we focus outside on what God is doing in others versus what God is doing in this specific person. Don't let other people's victory and other people's journey and other people's recovery be a means by which you dictate the current person's experience. We need to take the initiative to, in setting limits rather than be passive. The law of, of activity. This is something I'm learning in just work. You know what happens when you're passive? and you don't set certain expectations and certain requirements and certain things, before you know it, all of a sudden, there is a sense of being taken advantage of. That if you don't set the boundaries and limits and the expectations ahead of time, where it's clear and transparent, people will start to push the buttons and push the limits. And they'll say, you didn't let me manage my expectations right. You didn't tell me what I was supposed to expect. You're, it's your fault. And in a way, it is. Because you didn't set the limit ahead of time, and you were, you were passive about it. Is that once that person, because people are going to try to press their limits, they're going to try to break your boundary, they're going to try to say, I need you now, now, now. Two o'clock in the morning, hey, are you there? Wake, wake, wake up, I need to talk to you. Hey man, I'm sleeping, I got work tomorrow. And the first time you do it, they'll expect it on the second time, and they'll expect it on the third time. But if you don't set that limit from the beginning, They'll constantly be trying to push it. The law of exposure. We need to communicate our boundaries to each other. And again, I don't want to harp too much on boundaries because I think sometimes we shy on the area of maybe setting too many boundaries or maybe not setting enough boundaries at all. There's extremes. But each person has to evaluate within themselves what the goal is. And again, not to create a sense of dependence, but to create a sense of encouragement. What is the ministry layout? So let me just tell you guys how this is going to work. So the priest refers the person to the Warren Pornography Ministry. So the hope is that every church will now have a Warren Pornography Ministry. where They'll have a group of mentors, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, hopefully a lot, two, three to start maybe. So the priest will sit with the person in confession and he'll say, I think you need to go to the Warren Porn Ministry. And it's a secret. It's not something that is exposed to the whole church. And people go out and they say, hey, I'm a member of the Warren Porn Ministry. No. There is a sense of confidentiality 
where the priest will say, hey, Chris, I, th I would like you to meet with this person. So the servant will make an initial contact within seven days to meet with the person. So priest meets the person and contacts you. You have seven days to reach out to the person and set up an initial meeting. At the initial meeting, the servant will introduce the ministry and discuss boundaries, what the goal is. You'll have those resources, the 10 laws of boundaries with the member and ex ex explain the scope of this ministry. Explain what the hope is, explain what you're trying to do. Then the servant needs to complete a sexual addiction screening test assessment and a spiritual inventory. So this, we have a book now that we've created and in this book we will share with you the specific assessments. The book, the book is like this. In this book you'll find a sexual assessment, a sexual addiction assessment, you'll find a spiritual inventory and you'll have that assessment with the person. And digitally is better because then you can print it out and you can provide it for each person. From there, for the first three weeks, the servant will have one call and one text daily and two meetings weekly. One call, one text daily, and two meetings weekly. One face-to-face -face and one Skype. Now you think to yourself, man, that's a lot. But initially, for the first three weeks, that's when the person is most vulnerable. So does the call need to be three hours? No, the call needs to be, hey, I'm thinking of you. I want to just check up on you. How are you doing today? I'm praying with you. A text later on in the day saying, hey, how's it going today? Keep on fighting the good fight. Maybe it's a verse. Maybe some sense of encouragement. And then you'll have a FaceTime meeting or Skype meeting once a week. And the goal is to see them once a week in person. So in total, that's probably a total of maybe per week three hours. Three hours. Think about what you do throughout your week. Think about how much time is wasted on Netflix. Think about how much time is wasted on so many other things. Instead of maybe watching one episode of whatever you're watching, here's the opportunity to just call that person or to text that person in the evening. Or maybe to FaceTime that person in one evening. So there's a commitment and there's expectation, but think about the potential that you can have to help a person in their struggle and their healing. And God can use you as a means of hope and as a, to, to the, hope for the, for the hope for the hopeless and the help for the helpless. That you can be that means. Then from there, the servant will encourage the member to confess and meet with regularly with their father confession for at least the first month. Once a week, we, we said or once every other week, very regularly meeting with their father confession for the first month. So it's not just you as the mentor being the sole person in the process, but the priest is also in the process with you. So the priest will refer, you'll see that person within the first seven days, you'll make the contact, you'll, meet, you'll talk to them once a day, text them once a day, talk, talk to them via FaceTime once a week, meet them once a week. Priest will meet them very regularly for confession. Follow the exercises. Now this is key. Because what is the person going to be doing every day? So we have a group, we have a, a, in this book, freedom exercises that a person will do for the next 90 days. Every day there is an exercise that, will, that they'll do that has scripture, that has questions, that has a sense of them evaluating themselves, processing certain experiences that they've had in their life. And again, we've adapted this from other resources, but put our tradition in it. So the book is from Douglas Weiss, but again, we've adapted it and made it utilized for us. The servant will assist the member in creating a problem list, record a secret list, complete a list of old excuses, and complete a list of consequences. And again, this will make more sense once you see how the booklet is laid out. Assign daily readings and a spiritual, spiritual program to help battle sexual addiction. So in conjunction with the freedom exercises that the person is doing, we also want to, we want to have them be built on a solid foundation, which is scripture. So we also have a reading plan that we've put together that is from the YouVersion Bible that has various different pieces of scripture that are there to encourage you when you're, going, when, you're, when you're mentoring somebody and when a person is struggling 
with pornography addiction. Because again, if we just give them resources to do without connecting them to Christ, this just becomes therapy. It doesn't become a means for us to link them to Christ and the church. Does that make sense? And finally, at the end of the 90 days, the member will meet with his or her father confession to determine if the member needs to enroll in another round of the program. So what happens if after day three, the person relapses? We restart. We restart. And again, this sounds very intensive, but that's what we need. We need a sense of intensiveness to really be able to tackle this problem. So our hope is, is that now we're, we're, if anyone, and especially as this is going out to the global church, if anyone wants this booklet, email info at St. Mark's DC. Info at St. Mark's DC, and we'll provide this resource to anyone who wants it. For the, all of you that are here, we'll send it out via email, included with um, the booklet and various other resources that you can start to provide. But the goal is at the end of this day that we have people that sign up from St. Mark's local to be mentors, and the goal is, is that people that are visiting from out of town will start to begin this war on poor ministry in their church as well.